Good evening and welcome to tonight's Driver's Ed program. Last day of the week for our class, so please sign in. We're almost through the week. I'm hoping that I don't have a problem with my microphone. I did update. So hopefully that will take care of the the echo. I also think that when I switch between a movie and I jump in the middle. Good evening, Jack. So remember to sign in on your phone. Sign in your phone. This is the your this is the attendance. When you sign in with Google, it helps me so I can look at the camera and look who's here. That way I don't have to check my phone because the phone doesn't really give me an idea of really who's here until I get done teaching for the evening and I can kind of scroll through. So we're going to wait for um, most people to log on. We've almost got a full class because I do want to kind of go over a few things before we get going um, with tonight's topic. I do have some openings for driving tomorrow, Saturday and Tuesday. I will not be driving on Monday. Monday, I'm going to take the holiday. My wife has it off, so I said, I'll take it off. So I think we have plenty of time to get most of the driving that we need done. But once again, let me stress, try to schedule twice a week. I know not everyone was able to do that this week, but it's important uh, because of bad weather that could be looming just around the corner. In the next couple of weeks, we've been blessed with cold, dry temperatures, which makes it fine to drive. But once the road gets a little bit slippery and dangerous, uh, drive times have a tendency to uh, be less uh, for availability. So if you want to write this down and text me a little bit later, um, and I'll try to put it on too um, a little bit later. I have uh, 9 o'clock tomorrow morning and 2 o'clock in the afternoon. On Saturday, I have 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock, 1, 2, and 3 o'clock. So I have five openings. And on Tuesday, I have the afternoon open around 3 or 4. Now, some of you uh, are open during the day. I may be texting you privately uh, to schedule you in. Um, but those that don't have study halls, okay, you're relegated to the afternoon drive times. Because I can't drive with you at 10 or 11 or 12 or 1. But I think we've got three of you that I can drive with just about any time of the day, which is kind of good. All right, a couple of things about homework. Not everybody is consistent. So we've got to kind of hunker down and, and get better at getting the information in. So the sheet that I gave you okay, tells you the chapter that you're supposed to be reading. Now, when you do the chapter test at the end, just write it on a scrap piece of paper, A, B, C, D, and then send it along to me. That lets me know that you did your reading. At the end of my talk, we'll probably have either, either worksheets or questions that's through a test generator. The questions are a little bit more involved than the test questions at the end of the chapter. Okay, It's on Facebook. Most of you have been doing it. Some of you have not. If you can't get Facebook or don't have it, I have to manually send you the link so you can do it offline from Facebook. But it's a little bit more involved on my part. But you've got to let me know that it's not working out. So I want that homework in on a timely manner. I don't want you to be doing it. Um, okay, Jack just said he's got 10 o'clock on Saturday. So uh, I just saw that. So that's fine. So if it pops up on the screen, um, then I'll, I'll, I'll take it and write it down and make a comment from it. Um, I think we've got, let's see who we've got here today. Troy, welcome. 
I need something from you, okay? Uh, when I ask people to text me uh, the first class, their name, their address, um, all that stuff, I really needed that. Now, I was able to piece together um, the information because you sent me your birth certificate today. So thank you for doing that. But it was so close because I had to send the paperwork in um, this afternoon who was going to be in the program. So, Troy, you almost got booted out of the program because I didn't have enough information. I looked at your registration through Eventbrite, and it was only partial. So I'm not getting complete information, and I don't think I have any homework uh, uh, from you. So, okay, you've got to – we got to talk. we got to text. So, and we haven't driven yet. So that's important that we start to schedule that. Uh, if you have any questions about the homework or anything else that we discuss here in class or even drive times, just keep texting me. Text me during the day. I may be with students. I may not. But I'll try to get back to you in a timely manner. Um, that way I can get all the information that I need. I feel my... my... Okay, I'm starting to get stuff through my my uh, phone on my iWatch here. So I'm trying to ju uh, juggle everything that's going on right here. All right, uh, let's get to tonight's topic. We're going to talk a little bit about knowing your vehicle. We're going to talk about manual transmission because some of you have mentioned that you actually drive a manual, which is kind of cool uh, because not very many people have manual transmission vehicles. So today we're going to focus on um, the inside of the vehicle and what to expect. We're going to have some terminology. We're going to be talking about the instrument panel. We want to get you familiar with um, all the warning lights that would be uh, coming on in case there was a problem with your vehicle. And part of your homework will be a worksheet. So we have a car worksheet, which will be at the end of tonight's class. And during class, I'm going to give you about five, 10 minutes to do um, another worksheet that I'm going to throw on on the PowerPoint. But let's get back to finishing up last night's topic on the highway transportation system. And we're talking about making roads safer. One of the homework, oh, the homework assignment that I gave you, remember, was Google Earth. Um, I know that some of you, I know Sabrina, I know that Jake has done it, and I think a few others. I think um, I saw that. I think it was Sonia. I think someone else had done it too. So some of you had done it. Go to Google Earth and locate a place that you either have driven or you have been a passenger that you feel is unsafe. And kind of zoom in on that area. And then I want you to give me about uh, three or four sentences of what makes it dangerous and what could be done to make it a little bit safer. Now here's a picture of a major roadway. Um, in Myanmar, and what they thought was going to happen, they were going to build this huge city, and in order to have everybody travel into the city, they figured they'd have to build a major highway. So I believe it is a 10-lane highway in both directions. But whatever happened, I haven't done the research, but whatever happened, people didn't move to the city. And now they're left with this huge, huge highway that nobody uses. And if you take a look at the picture, way up at the top left-hand corner, it is so vacant that pedestrians can actually jump the fence and walk across 20 lanes to get to the other side. That's crazy, okay, um, that they overbuilt this particular area. Now, here's a situation now how I told you that there's unsafe places. So here's an example that I give to all the classes, and I didn't show it to you last night, but this is in the town of Milton. Milton is just north of Rochester, and the question is what could be different? Don't you think it's kind of odd that they put a telephone pole about a foot and a half, two feet out into the roadway? Can you imagine if you're not from this area and you're driving down the road at night, and there's only one little reflector that's up about four feet to warn you that that pole is there. I would wrap that pole in, you know, tin foil, something that would uh, actually 
illuminate the whole whole pole. So that little reflector isn't very helpful. And then the other thing that makes this very unsafe is notice the guide wire. So if you're a pedestrian or a person, a young kid on a bike, a lot of kids ride their bikes on a sidewalk. So you wouldn't be, ex you know, expecting a guide wire going up to the telephone pole. It would just knock you right off your bike. Here's what it looks like from a different vantage point. And, and, and there's even a sign. I have no idea what the sign says. But to the right of this picture is the elementary school. And if you were to take a right just beyond this telephone pole, the high school is down the corner. And I used to teach driver's ed at this particular high school. Very small school. Um, but I will tell you, since I've taken this picture, and I've used this for many, many years, probably about seven or eight years, someone in the town was smart enough to get a hold of the power company and they have since moved this telephone pole, okay? And if we go back to the last picture, you know what's really funny? There's a telephone pole about eight feet away, which makes you think, well, if there's a pole there, why don't you just stretch the wires over to the other pole? You don't even have to put a new one. You just got to, you know, amend the wires. So I always thought that was kind of odd. Um, traffic jams, I don't have this video anymore. But I thought it was kind of strange when I was researching about traffic and I, I Google what is the longest traffic jam, meaning wait time. And as you can see from the video, people were stuck on a uh, Chinese roadway um, for nine days. I, I mean, they could not move. You're in your car, you're stuck. You were sleeping in your car for a week because you couldn't get off the highway. It was just bizarre, um, but I, I don't. I couldn't find the video. Um, I do want you to write down some terminology t today. So in our notes, uh, this is not from the manual. This is not from the textbook. Um, this is from the curriculum. Remember what we talked about yesterday, that the state is going to ask you some questions on the information that I give you. So what I want you to write down is the word risk. And risk is the chance of injury to yourself or to others and the chance of damage to your vehicle or property. And it's very real. It's more probable than you think. And the other thing that Andy Pilgrim mentioned was when you're driving and you're looking at your phone, you're not paying attention, you're being distracted, you're dangerous. So I want you to write down the term dangerous. Now, a person that crosses the yellow line is dangerous, but if you're driving and you're not concentrating on looking for people that are making mistakes and, and altering what you're doing behind the wheel, then you're going to be considered vulnerable, all right? V-U-L-N-E-R-A-B-L-E, -E, vulnerable. All right, so I'm going to show you what Andy describes as being distracted with being dangerous or vulnerable. Sides to the distracted driving issue that all drivers need to understand, and it revolves around overall awareness. If your eyes or mind are away from driving for some distraction, then you are always either dangerous or vulnerable. Let me explain. Many drivers, both experienced and new, believe they are safe and doing nothing wrong as they drive distracted, if you can believe that. They tell me they can drive distracted, maintain their speed, stay in their lane, etc. They actually tell me this as if they are above the distracted driving problem. I want to change this extremely dangerous perception right here. We've all seen or heard tragic stories about drivers hitting other vehicles head on. A driver who veers into another lane or into oncoming traffic is obviously completely unaware and dangerous. There is no doubt about that one, but let's look a little deeper. To the drivers who think they can successfully drive distracted, I explain this. You may think you can drive distracted and not be dangerous, but I know for certain you are vulnerable. Imagine for the sake of discussion that you were looking away from the road for a second or deep into your phone call right at the moment an oncoming vehicle veered into your lane. Exactly. You would not see them at all if you were looking away or you would react much slower because you were distracted and your mind was deep into the phone call. 
Not good, huh? Research shows us that this is accurate. Every day, this tragic scenario plays out on the roads. Bad choices followed by unfortunate timing. It takes two fully or partially distracted drivers coming together in most collisions and crashes. Never give up your chance to see distracted drivers coming into your driving space. I don't want you to be dangerous or vulnerable. And please, never with children in the vehicle. Many drivers, both experienced and new, are not respecting that driving is different. The potential downside to driving mistakes are well known to parents. Driving deserves more respect from all drivers. The cost of avoidable mistakes by new drivers is mind-numbing. We are talking avoidable heartbreak and billions in medical expenses, legal costs and property damage. There is a troubling trend I need parents to be aware of. Many teens are now waiting to take the driving test until they are 18 or 19 years of age. In most states, an 18 or 19-year-old can walk into a DMV and take their driving test with no driver training whatsoever. This information should clearly be a wake-up call to all parents. I definitely want to give a shout-out to parents watching who take driving very seriously and never drive distracted, especially when there are children in the vehicle. The information and knowledge here has to be aimed at the majority of parents and adults who drive distracted every day. I made my second PSA truth to give non-distracted driving parents and adults respect and to also shine another light on the extent of the distracted driving problem. I just never thought my kid was paying that much attention to my driving. Let's take a look at truth. I have three wonderful children. They've learned everything else from me. Why would driving be any different? Driving deserves respect. If something had happened to my kid because they had been driving with a distraction that I know in my heart they had learned from me, I would never forgive myself. It's not enough to tell them. With driving, you have to show them the right way. Before I get into obstacles, I want to share a very important piece of data about exactly how long most people drive with their children in their vehicle. There are variables to consider, such as age of the children, do the children go to daycare or school, one and two parent homes, etc. But the average amount of time parents spend ferrying their children around is usually between 10 and 30 hours a month. The average driver is in their car for 70 to 90 hours a month. Please make sure you drive distraction-free at all times, but especially when your children are in the vehicle. So, let's check out the obstacles. Well, distractions have been around a while. I'm going to explain why smartphones and smart devices are being singled out for so much discussion and new laws against their use while driving. Eating a burger and phone use are both driving distractions that cause vehicle collisions and crashes every day. But there is a very important difference between the many driving distractions such as eating a burger and the use of smartphones while driving. This difference is critical to understanding the whole distracted driving issue, and that is frequency. You don't spend hours eating a burger as you drive, but people do spend hours talking on the phone. The huge problem for new drivers is that they spend five to seven hours on their smartphones per day, but it's not phone calls for them, it's texting, email, updating message boards, etc. It's now reached four to 5,000 text messages a month for the average 14-year-old, and it's going up all the time. This texting or typing reality is exactly why all parents and adults need to separate their phone use from driving when children are in the vehicle. 
If parents consistently separate driving from phone use, then over time, children will see that driving is different and that smartphone use must wait. If adults don't separate their use of a smartphone while driving with their children in the car, then there is little to no chance their child will put the phone away as they start to drive. Remember, it's not enough just to tell them, you have to show them the Now, when we were talking about as he showed you in the video, that the smartphone is probably going to be the biggest problem that we face is because we are so connected to it. Now, I also thought it was kind of interesting when he goes out to elementary schools and junior highs and try to, you know, set an example with some of these young kids because he knows they're going to be in driver's ed soon or starting to work on their license. And he was asking them the questions about what type of behavior their parents has. So you're in the ninth or 10th grade. I think most of you are either sophomores or juniors. So I'm going to ask you to put up here on the YouTube, have you ever been in the car with your parents? So this is a chance to throw your par parents under the bus here. Um, have they ever gotten angry, showed road rage? Have they ever talked on their phone or text on their phone? Um, and what was the other one that he asked? Oh, eating. Have your parents ever been driving while they're eating? And just kind of put a yes or a no. And I'm going to suspect that everybody's going to answer yes because you're going to model the behavior. That's the whole point um, behind these videos. You don't realize what you've been indoctrinate, indoctrinated to. You've already had your parents kind of set the tone of what's acceptable and what's not acceptable. But now that it's your turn to get a license, your parents are going to do do as I say, not as I do. And you're going to be thinking, wait a minute here. You've been doing this for years and years and years. So if you do it, why can't I do it? Because I'm getting better at driving and I should be able to handle and do just exactly what you do. So that's where there's going to be a little bit of a conflict. And you can see that everybody's kind of answering in, you know, and I'll, I'll admit, yes. I mean, I love a cup of coffee. So I don't, I don't text while I drive. I never do that. I'm not going to do that. Um, but definitely eating. Okay. I'm on the road all the time. I'm not going to be munching down on a Subway sandwich, but, um, I definitely will be drinking a cup of coffee. Um, you know, and I may grab down and, you know, have a, a cracker or something if I, you know, pack my lunch or something, but anything that we do where we take our eyes off the road is going to make us a little bit vulnerable, may not make us dangerous, because we're not going over the lines, we're not going over the speed limit. But if something was to happen, I, I you know, you're just not going to be able to pick it up. So let's talk about what can we do to be better drivers? What can we do to be a little bit safer? Uh, keeping your vehicle in a top condition, that's kind of what we're going to be covering later today in class. But later in the third week of class, we're going to be talking more about choices and decision making, uh, anticipating the actions of other drivers. Um, next week, we're going to be talking about seatbelts, airbags, and helmets. So we're going to be talking about the protection that we have available to us inside the vehicle. Uh, drive only when you're in sound physical, mental condition. So we're going to have a class on alcohol, drugs, and fatigue. So we'll be covering that section a little bit later. And always try to make a conscious effort to develop your driving skills all the time. You always want to get better. So what are the foundations of being an effective driver? So I do want you to write this down. One thing that you're going to hear me stress throughout the whole program when you get in the car with me is that you've got to be looking down the road, searching and, and trying to figure out what am I responsible for? Do I need to really know what that sign is communicating to me? Because I asked some of you, some of you that drove today, one of the questions that I was asking is, you know, what do we do with a speed limit that's yellow? Because we know that, you know, the majority of speed limits are white. So why are they throwing a yellow speed limit our way? What is it really communicating? What are we responsible for? Understand your options and your choices. The worst thing to do as a driver is to think that you only have one choice. Uh, in your notes, what I want you to write down is 
that when you're driving, you should have at a minimum two to three choices. Two to three choices on everything that happens. Should I go right? Should I go left? Should I go straight? Should I go faster? Should I go slower? It shouldn't just be holding on to the steering wheel and hope and pray that everything's going to work out because eventually it won't. You have to be actively in the process of trying to make a bad situation better. And why you're here is you're trying to get better at basic driving skills. My whole aim and goal in this class is to lay out some of the skills of being a good driver and having you practice it and understanding the principles behind it so you can put it into your everyday drive with your parents and when you get your license when you're driving um, all alone. Now, you don't have to write down the definition, but I do want you to write down the term. So write down the, the terms visibility, time, and space. And we're going to get a little bit more involved in this in another class. But the whole principle of, of driving, as we said, your eyes are right at the beginning. Uh, think about it. If you are going to walk into your driving test, one of the first things that they do is to give you an eye test. Because guess what? Anybody that can't see very well, they're not going to get in the car with you. Okay, blind people cannot drive. So there is a selection process to who we have out on the road. And anybody that cannot see is not qualified to be out on the road. So we kind of, you know, wean through our uh, potential drivers by giving them an eye test first. Then they give you a knowledge test. Why would you let someone go out on the road to drive if they don't know what to do at a, a stop sign or how to yield or what to do when there's pedestrians or following a fire truck or, you know, a, a number of things that we're going to be going over in this class. So you've got to show that you are competent and you have basic knowledge of certain driving skills. And then lastly, they take you out to see how well you have mastered the physical aspect of moving a vehicle. So time and space is the, the, the practical part. Trying to maneuver your vehicle around other highway users. And what is the distance that you have to the front, to the back, to the left, to the side of your vehicle? So we're constantly uh, looking in our mirrors. And there hasn't been a single one of you that have driven with me this week that I haven't stressed to you. Before a turn, check your mirrors. After a turn, check your mirrors. Make sure your mirrors are adjusted well and check them constantly. That's something that I want you to remember from this program. Um, don't need that one. Um, I think we're going to skip over that. And I didn't load this video. Uh, okay, let's get into um, understanding the vehicle. Okay, I want you to write down, are you really ready to drive? And under this category, are you really ready to drive? We're going to start to, to break down the different um, items inside the driver's ed vehicle or your, even your vehicle, any vehicle, actually, because I think we have a basic knowledge of directionals, headlights. Um, if you've driven in the rain, you probably know where the wipers are. But I'd almost guarantee that there's someone in this class that have been driving with your parents and you have not driven in the rain. So if it started to rain, I would almost bet you would have a hard time instantly finding the wipers. You probably would eventually, but it would be a little bit of a problem to activate them. And you probably wouldn't stay in your lane while you're looking how to get them going. So it's very important with every car that you drive, you have a basic understanding of all the basic functions of an automobile. So we're going to kind of break it down from the moment that you walk towards your vehicle till you get in the car and drive away. And once you're driving, what are the different warning uh, lights and um, gauges that are going to give you information to help you be safe out there on the road? So the first thing I want you to write down is once you've got your license, you should have a basic knowledge of where you're located and where you want to go. Now, 10, 15 years ago, we didn't have smartphones, and we just started to get uh, GPS um, in most vehicles back about that time. So here we are, as we said, technology is constantly changing. So we have it in our park, pocket with our uh, smartphones. We also have GPS now 
on most cars, I would say, you have the ability to track where you're going. But you should have a basic sense of north, south, east, west. So I want you to write that down. All of you should understand which direction that you're heading. Um, I'm going to pick on uh, people that have driven with me. So uh, Colette drove today. Uh, Jake drove today. Um, I never asked the question. I should have thought about what we were going to cover in class today. But there is a way to know which direction that you're going in an automobile, in most cars. Let's see if someone can put it up on the comment on YouTube. So it doesn't have to be the people that drove today. But in most cars, there is a way that you can tell which direction that you're heading north, south, east, west. So let's see if someone can put it in the comments and see if someone can guess it right. I'll tell you a little bit later. So here we are in Durham. Uh, the major interstate that we have close by is Interstate 95. But we also have state routes. And even though you've lived in Lee, Madbury, Durham for most of your life, and you've been on all these roads, you probably know these roads by sight, meaning knowing uh, you see a, a building or a business and you kind of know where you are in relationship to some of these towns, whether you're going in the correct direction. But you got to start reading your signs now. you got to start knowing, are you going north? Are you going south, east, west? And what are the route numbers? So the two major route numbers that you'll be driving with me will be State Route 108, which is over near the Irving Gas Station in Durham, and the Mobile Station and over near Jackson Landing. And on the west part of Durham, it's 155. And that takes you through Lee, Madbury, and into Dover. Those are the two roads that we travel almost every single drive time with me. We're going to be on one of those roads. Uh, when we do some practicing for highway driving, we'll be using um, Route 4, uh, the Spalding Turnpike, which is taking us over the bridge into Portsmouth. Um, we really don't get on 95. Every once in a while, I'll take a student. We'll, we'll hit up 95 for maybe just a little bit depending on what traffic is like. But we can't venture too far out in an hour's time. We can go 20 minutes to a half hour out, and then we got to get back to where we got to pick up the next student. So we're kind of limited. We, we can't go linear one hour out. So kind of know where you're going. Start understanding that you've got numbers of routes that are communicating direction. Um, we kind of already talked about this fatigue under the influence of drugs, body ailments, depression, excitement. Um, once you get your license, and like they said in the video, Andy said in the video, um, you're going to be driving probably 80 to 90 to 100 hours a month. That's a lot. So you're going to be having good days, bad days. You're going to be happy. You're going to be sad. You take your personality. You take your emotional state with you when you get in a car. So don't expect every drive to be perfect because some days you're going to drive like you never had a license and you're making all these mistakes and other days you're going to be on top of your game and everything's going right, all the traffic lights are green, you're stopping at your stop lines, your speed's good, and it's just a great day to drive. Other days you're not paying attention because you're thinking about a uh, test that you just bombed, you may have to go to summer school, or you got called into work and you don't want to work this weekend, and you're not thinking about driving, and you're going to start making all these mistakes. That's part of life. You're going to have to learn how to overcome it. You just don't want to get anybody else involved in a crash, and that's why I say you know there is risk in driving. So we try to be at our best most of the time. Uh, other situations that can kind of hinder your drive is your weather conditions. Okay, some of you drive well during the day, but guess what? When you drive at night, it's going to be a little bit more difficult. Driving in rain, fog, snow. You may not see the road very well. You may not see your parking spaces very well. So you normally park well, but now you're in a parking lot that's got two inches of snow. So how do you park next to a car with it when there's no lines? So we're going to have to address that and learn what to do. And we'll talk about that. We actually will. We'll cover that in class because there is a technique and there's a way to handle it. Uh, traffic conditions. 
I know when your parents start out driving with you, I always tell parents, why would you take your son or daughter out that's only driven two or three times and put them right out on a highway during a holiday going to, you know, Thanksgiving to grandma's house? It's heavy traffic and everybody goes too fast, follows too close. It's going to be way too stressful. I would almost bet there are some of you in this class right now that will say that you have been in the car driving and you were stressed out. You are at a level where you did not feel comfortable or in control of driving the vehicle. So at that point, I believe that there is no learning taking place. It's all survival. Because a lot of times when I teach people certain things to do and we go back to review it, they don't even remember a single thing that I had taught them. It's like, why don't you remember? And then I got to think, okay, they did look a little bit uncomfortable. They didn't really feel um, like they were really ready for it. But because we we're running out of time, I had to throw them up on the highway or to teach them backing into a parking spot. And now they don't remember the steps to take to get in. So if you're really stressed out, there's a lot that's going to be lost in your retention of, of what's happening. So just remember that learning should be in a place that you feel comfortable and that you can retain and learn from the experience. But if you're stressed out, it's not going to be too good. There's the driver's ed vehicle. So for those of you that have um, not driven, that's what we look like. All right. So when you come to the school, I'm usually right there in front of the school sign. Um, I may be, you know, a little bit up closer to the office or I may be uh, on the parking spots that are closest to the road. But you'll see me, white car, yellow sign, piece of cheese on top. Uh, so look for me. So when you come to the driver's ed vehicle, um, I know that a lot of times it's I've already driven with a student, so we've already driven up to the parking spot. So in, in reality, we may not have to do this, but I want you to start thinking about approaching a vehicle that has been left in a parking lot for at least a couple hours. Let's give the example that we are at the movies and we come out to the car after the movies. What should we be looking for? Look up the right side of the car, left side of the car. Look around the back. Are there any shopping carts? Are there any, you know, maybe garbage, debris, bottles, things? Make sure the tires don't look like they're fl uh, flat. Uh, has anybody damaged the lights? Is there any fluid leaking underneath the vehicle? Do you still have both license plates? And I put this up here, and a lot of people have, have always asked me, why would I be looking if I still have a license plate? You'd be surprised. People may not steal your car, but they may steal your license plate. People have been known to steal license plates because guess what? If, if you've done something illegal and they can ID the car, it's a white car, and they're going to get a partial you know, license plate number, they're going to find out who it is. But if you're putting on somebody else's license plate, it's just not going to match up when they report it. They go, we don't have a car with that sequence of numbers and it's white Camry. We just don't have it. it. That license plate you're giving us really belongs to a blue truck. Okay. So don't be surprised if you, if you hear or see license plates removed from a car. Uh, windows, people will uh, break the back window to get into a vehicle. So you're walking to your car. If you don't go over on the passenger side, you may not notice that someone broke through the other window to get in to get your laptop, to get something inside that they see. So anything that you have um, valuable, I would um, recommend putting in the glove compartment, trunk, or someplace, or cover it so people can't look through a window and say, oh, you know, I, I want that because they'll bust out a window in a heartbeat to get it. And the last thing that I want to talk about is carjacking. And you may think this is New Hampshire. It's rural. It just doesn't happen. But one of the first things I want you to do when you get in the driver's ed vehicle is to lock the car because we don't want people getting inside the car. Carjacking, the easiest way to steal a car is a car that is running. So uh, write this down in your notes. I think this is coming up on the next slide. Oh, check for animals. Write that down. Uh, dogs and cats have a tendency to want to be underneath the wheel well. They want to be someplace where it's warm. I forgot I talked about animals. 
So if you have a, a, a pet. And the other thing, too, in the wintertime, make sure that nobody's behind your car. There's not a year that goes by where there isn't a story in the paper where somebody backed out of a driveway or backed out into a road and did not see a child playing and ran over a child or ran into a pedestrian. Because when winter weather creates frost and ice on a window, your visibility is bad. And young kids all bundle up, you know, and they have really small, weak voices. You may, if you've got the radio going, you may not hear. So backing into people is very common. So check around your vehicle. Oh, the other thing about checking around your vehicle, let me show you this first. If you live in Florida, th this is why you check around your vehicle if you live in Florida. So back to carjacking. So how do we handle carjacking? So I want you to write this down. Carjacking happens when the car is usually running, all right? It can happen when you are approaching your vehicle with your keys in your hand. So always approach your vehicle with your keys ready uh, so you can hit the panic button. Or if someone tries to grab your keys, that you can use the metal blunt edges of a key to maybe you know, uh, put a scrape on his face, um, to scrape his arm or whatever. It's not a knife. It's not going to do a deep cut, but it will leave a mark. Uh, there could probably be some blood with it. Um, so if he runs away, you might be able to ID him by the mark that you left. But look around. Make sure that nobody's coming up behind you. I will tell you that it wasn't a carjacking, but it seemed like a carjacking uh, in the driver's ed vehicle. We were driving in Dover. I had a student with me. We were stopped at a stop sign, and we did have a student in the back seat. And we were stopped at a stop sign waiting for an opening in traffic when someone tried to get in the back door. It totally freaked out the driver and the observer. Okay, it was on their side of the car. I was on the opposite side. And he really wanted to get in. He banged on the window, and he was trying to rattle the door handle, but we had it locked, so he couldn't get in. Now, it was Halloween Eve. We were in downtown Dover at around 6.30 at night. And I believe he was intoxicated. I believe he was drunk. I also believe he thought we were a taxi. And he wanted to get inside for a ride. But it still was pretty scary. So you just never know when something could happen. So make sure your car is locked. Oh, there's checking around the vehicle. All right, so you've checked around the vehicle. You've entered the vehicle. Now, first thing you do is to lock your doors. The nice thing about the driver's ed vehicle is once you get up to around six, seven miles per hour, it locks. Locks automatically. And by um, let me know if there's an echo. I'm trying to keep on clicking the use of the echo cancellation button. It goes on and off. So I hope there's no echo tonight. So please let me know. Um, adjust the seat is the second thing that you do. Make very uh, sure that you are in a good driving posture, that you can grab the steering wheel with a slight bend to your elbow. I, I don't want you to grab the steering wheel um, straight armed. And I don't want you grabbing the steering wheel where your arms are pinned up against the side of your body. That's way too close because the airbag needs to come out. So you lock your doors, you adjust your seat, then you lock the seat belts. Now, in your notes, make sure that you understand, write down, everyone wears a seat belt regardless of age. You are the captain of your car. You're the one in charge. Make sure that everybody that rides with you understands if you're in my car, you got your seatbelt on because you are going to be held liable for anything that happens to anybody that's inside your vehicle. So a seatbelt will reduce injuries. Does it prevent? Yeah, it does. Can you still be injured with a seatbelt? Yeah, probably. But the chances are better that if you do have your seatbelt on and have a car that is... Um, reliable in a crash rating 
and also to have airbags. And most newer cars now are equipped with airbags in the front. Now we're getting airbags even in the back. But we'll talk more about that a little bit later. Um, inside the vehicle, make sure that you adjust the mirrors. I like, if you take a look at the bottom one with the side mirror, I like a little bit of the side of the car in the mirror. I'm old school. I like to see my car in relationship to the car that's coming up on the side, as you see in the bottom picture. The rear view mirror should be all back window as much as you can. Now, you probably will get a little bit of the back post, but that's okay as long as you've got the majority of the, of the mirror. Um, take a look at the rear view mirror. If you take a look at the two cars to the left and to the right, you can not only see them in your rear view mirror, but you can see them in your side view mirror. So it, it, it reinforces what you're seeing. And this is what it would look like from behind. So if you take a look at the dotted orange and the dotted blue line, there's an area where there's an overlap. Okay, that's what we see in the mirrors. But what they're trying to teach students now is that you don't want to see a car in your side view mirror. You can only see the three cars in your rear view mirror. So you're pushing the left and the right. So there, it's pushing it out to the left and to the right. So there is no overlap with the colored lines. So the green and the blue just barely come together at the very top, and the orange and the green just barely come together at the very top. But notice that as the car to the left and to the right gets almost nose to nose with you, so their front bumper is probably at your seat. When you look in your side view mirror, you're only going to see a very small portion of their vehicle, and that's going to help eliminate your blind spots. To move a vehicle, we said uh, we got to know how to start it. It'd be pretty embarrassing going for your driving test, and you come out and you forgot how to put the key in the car and, and start her up. Now, in the driver's ed car, I keep it running all the time. I don't want you touching the power button. I keep the keys with me. Um, also, some of you are getting used to my car, getting it into gear. So be very comfortable in the vehicle that you're using for your test that you put it in the gear that you need to be in. I will tell you, sometimes people, and you can write this down, some of you, when you need to be in drive, you're in reverse. Sometimes when you guys need to be in reverse, you're in drive. So what I want you to write down in your notes is take your time, think about what gear you're going into, and then put it into gear. It's the people that are rushing and thinking about what the uh, instructor or what I'm telling you to do and your mind's not processing everything and you skip the, the step of putting it in the appropriate gear. Just slow it down. Take your time. <clears throat> and we'll talk about the steering wheel and how to grab it. Um, let's go through the gear selection. So from um, top to bottom, or from left to right, it's P, R, N, D, and usually one or two, or S and L uh, in the driver's ed car, it's B. So let's deal with each one. Uh, P is for park. Uh, that's the gear that you should be in when you start the car and where you should end your drive, put it back in park. Uh, R is for reverse. That's used for putting the car to go backwards. Now, the reason why I go over this, I'll tell you a funny story. It's one of the funniest stories that I have. No lie, I had a driving student. We were in a parking space um, at a school, and there was an empty parking spot in front of us. And first time out driving, and she was told to leave the parking lot by pulling through the empty parking spot and to leave the exit. She put it in reverse, and we almost ran into, there was a group of people, that's why I wanted them to, her to pull through, is because there was like 30, 40 people, just one run after another, walking behind us. So we really didn't have a lot of time 
to, to back out. And I just wanted to get out on the road and start the lesson. But she put it in reverse and she almost hit the pedestrians. And I said, I told you, I want you to pull through the empty parking spot. She goes, oh, I'm sorry. I thought R was for ride. She didn't understand what those letters meant. She thought R was for ride. She thought she was going to go forward. So you'd be surprised how many people put it into one of these letters and they have no clue what it's going to do. So you've got to know N is for neutral, D is for drive, R is for reverse. And by the way, neutral is the only other gear that you can actually start a car in. So if there comes a time when it's a little bit difficult to start it, go to neutral, see if the problem still happens. Now, most people don't understand what the two gears are after drive, the L1, L2, or the S and the L. Those are lower gears, which means that if you're towing a trailer, trying to get up a hill um, in bad weather, you want your tires to go at a, a lower torque, a lower gear. It's almost like making your car like a standard. So just put it in a lower gear and it will help you um, get up, up the hill. This is what it looks like in the driver's ed vehicle. You can see that you've got to move over to the right and then down to get it in reverse and drive. So that's what you're going to be encountering when you come out. Now, with the steering wheel, I do want you to write this down. I, I really want you to grab the steering wheel with both hands. Excuse me. Do I want you to grab it with both hands all the time? No, you can take one hand off every once in a while. You know, if you've got an itch or whatever, but I, I don't want most of your driving with one hand. Now, if you're in reverse, that's totally different. But I don't care if you grab it at 10 and 2, 9 and 3, or 8 and 4. I want you to find a comfortable position and live with it. Driving should be that you're preparing for any situation that could arise. You're not going to be able to handle it with just one, one hand. Now, even though one hand can go about three quarters in each direction. So if you're down, and I'll click out of here. I should get a steering wheel and bring it in. So if you're grabbing the steering wheel, you can go three quarters of the way around. You can almost go all the way around uh, with the steering wheel. But I don't care if you grab it 10 and 2, 9 and 3, 8 and 4. All right? So you got those three positions, up high, equal on the side, or a little bit low. Whatever, whatever works for you. I'm not a big, you know, stickler on, on which one you're going to use. Hand over hand is what I recommend. I, I think it's wise and it makes a more fluid turn if you're turning the wheel from the top. Uh, push pull is from the bottom, eight and four. If you want to use that, that's fine. I don't have a problem with that. I never want your hands in the middle. That's where the airbag's going to be coming out. The airbag comes out in like two one hundredths of a second. I mean, it's like so super fast. You could never get your hands away from the middle portion of the steering wheel if we're on a crash course with another vehicle. Uh, tilt uh, is on the vehicle, on the steering wheel, I should say. So get in a comfortable position. Some of you need to use this, I think. I uh, let some of you go a little bit far away with where you're sitting, but you seem to be comfortable with it. So we'll go with that. And I will almost bet, because my last class, I've got three students left over from my last class. So, um, and they're more than halfway through. So I most, and there was 14 students. So there was 140 hours of driving that I had to do. There was not a single student that used the horn the whole time we drove. Think about it. If there's a horn in the car, do you think you should ever use it? Yes. There are times that you should use it. Now, within those 140 hours that I've done with other students, you would think there would be at least one person that would have used it with either um, a pedestrian that wasn't paying attention, um, a person backing out of a parking spot downtown that wasn't looking or coming out too slow. Those are times you're going to use it. You're not using it out of anger. You're not angry at people. I don't want you to use the horn to be angry. I want you to use the horn to let people know, hey, I'm here. Look at me. Don't, you know, don't wander out into the road. I'm using it right now. 
So let's see if this class has anybody that will actually use the horn. Um, I don't have these video clips anymore. That is my wife. Um, she's showing you the hand position for reverse. Uh, you put your left hand at 12 o'clock. You can put your right hand behind the seat. Uh, if you like, use it that way. Now, hand over hand has to have both hands starting. Now, when you make a left hand turn, you're going to start with your right hand turning towards the left. The left hand comes up at one o'clock and finishes the turn. When you make a right hand turn, your left hand. So it's always the opposite hand and it's going a half turn. So whether it be from three to nine or from nine to three, that is the beginning of your turn. It's very fluid. It's very smooth. So if you want to write this down in your notes, because they only have you there for a short period of time, your 15, 20 minutes with a driving instructor, hand position and smoothness of your turn goes a big way to pass your test. A person that doesn't make a good smooth turn, they're going to probably look a little bit less favorably on you passing. So if you start messing up with the bad turn and the bad hand position, they're going to want you to practice more. They're going to send you back and you may not want to do that, but you know, it, it really, your technique, your technique of how you're doing something shows the amount of work that you've put into becoming a good driver. So if you're willy nilly and doing whatever you feel is right and feels good and you're okay with it, these people aren't impressed. I'll tell you that. All right. So you've got to, you got to impress them. Uh, push pull. I'm not a big fan. That's where you're grabbing the wheel at eight and four and you only turn the wheel three or four inches at a time. So it's kind of like a, you know, a shuffle. Your hands are going a mile a minute, you know, shuffle, shuffle, shuffle. It's really choppy. Um, at slower speeds, like getting into a parking spot or around a traffic circle, uh, I think it will work and it does work. But if you're making a regular turn at an intersection, I would not do push pull. I would do hand over hand um, every day. Uh, foot position, I like the heel on the floor, pivot between the accelerator and the brake pedal. Now, write this down, dead pedal. For those of you that have been driving with me, I've pointed this out to you. A dead pedal is a piece of plastic that looks like a pedal off to the left. That's where you rest your foot so it doesn't get caught underneath your right foot. But the whole purpose of a dead pedal is to help push your body up against the back of your seat. So when you're taking a turn a little bit too quick, you're pushing on that pedal and it's keeping you upright behind the steering wheel. Like that shiny cable, that is the cable that goes from your brake to my brake. Okay, so that's uh, my brake is connected to yours. So when I push down on mine, yours goes down. It's going to freak you out when it does happen. Most people don't realize it half the time that I do it. Okay, we're going to go through some definitions right now. So um, you got to take some notes. Don't write everything that's written up here, but just write the top term, which is light acceleration. And all I want you to write down is it's used for smooth starts. It's at the beginning from a stop position. So you're at a traffic light or a stop sign. Light acceleration is just letting go of the brake pedal, slightly using the accelerator, and the car is gently going up around 5, 10, 15 miles per hour. That is light acceleration. If the car jerks backwards, then you're hitting the pedal too hard, and you don't want that. So just at the beginning of the movement of the vehicle. One is progressive acceleration, progressive acceleration. So once we've gone from light acceleration, so we're probably up around 10 to 15 miles per hour now, now you're using a little bit more pressure. You're moving the car up to what the posted speed limit is, 30, 40, 55, 65. 
you're you're pushing, 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 pushing until you get to where you want it, and then you're backing off a little bit and maintaining. Okay, you gotta understand you're getting it up to speed and then maintaining. You're not just continuing to push because you, then you're going too fast. So we want nice, steady cover break. Cover break is when the ball of your right foot is hovering. So you're not touching the brake pedal. You're just kind of hovering over it. It's used when you think something is going to happen. Okay, that's anticipation. Uh, we use it when we go down a hill. We don't really want to slow down because we're going to need a little bit of the speed coming up on the next hill. So we kind of cover because if it does get too high, then we're going to be ready to use it. So covering the brake is just putting it over but not actually using it because you think you're going to need it in a moment. Next term, control brake. That is firm, steady, even pressure on the brake pedal. Just put normal braking. It's non-emergencies. Um, and try not to have the vehicle dip. Now, when the vehicle dips or what we call pitch, pitching is when the vehicle goes forward and then it comes backwards. That means you've come to a full stop. Now, what I've got down here says practice a limousine stop. What a limousine stop is, if you've ever been in a limousine, they've trained the drivers not to do anything too harshly because there could be people in the back that are eating, drinking, and they don't want, you know, you know, spills and mess up the clothes that they're in. So they've trained their drivers to break about 10 to 15 feet before the stop line. And just before they have the vehicle come to a stop, they let go of the accelerator a little bit, and then the vehicle moves up the remainder 10 to 15 feet. It's almost like you can't feel the pitch at all. It's really um, a sign that someone's got complete control of that brake pedal. It's really impressive when you can do it. Okay, and I've had a few students try to work on it, and it's kind of cool to see that they, they're, they're putting that in. And it helps you to be more accurate with your stop lines. Most people try to be too perfect, and they overshoot the stop line by about a foot, foot and a half. Okay, we don't want that to happen. Uh, trail braking is a, a light decrease of pressure on the brake pedal. It's used um, in the following situations, the last few seconds. Um, to stop a vehicle in a limousine stop. We use trail braking for backing up out of a driveway. We use it for moving forward in heavy traffic, um, moving up into a parking spot when we creep up, and at the beginning of a turn. Okay, we let go of the brake as we pull away from a stop sign, and then we get to the light acceleration. So this is just control of the pedals. Threshold braking is emergency. So just write down, threshold braking is full force on the brake pedal, and it's used for an emergency. The thing to remember about hitting the brake pedal, you cannot brake the brake. Think about that. You cannot brake the brake pedal. You can you could stomp on it as hard as you want, physically as hard as you want, and you're not going to brake it. It will take it, all right? The car will take it. Now, we're going to come to a screeching halt, Depending on the speed that you're going, it's going to be pretty abrupt. But if it comes to hitting an object, hitting a pedestrian, you want every ounce of braking ability that you have to lessen the impact. And that's what you're looking for. I would say threshold braking in the driver's ed car happens maybe a handful of times in a whole year worth of driving. It's just not a type of braking that we have to, to do because we're usually on top of things. We, we can see things happening before they do, so we, it, we're not taken by surprise, and it's not an emergency. It's a concern, but most driving situations with us are not you know, full emergencies, which is kind of cool. Uh, I want you to think about this. The accelerator and the brake pedal. The brake is the most important pedal. We've talked about that. It keeps you from going where you don't want to go. Both pedals, if you're a skilled driver, can be learned about 10 to 15 minutes. So when your parents uh, fly to, you know, uh, the Bahamas and they have a rental car, it won't take them too long to get used to that vehicle because they've got a lot of experience driving different cars. You, on the other hand, it may take you an hour 
two hours, three hours, until you really understand the, the sensitivity of the pedals. And this I do want you to write down. Both pedals will make the vehicle do the opposite of what its intention is. Think about it. When we think of an accelerator, we always think about going faster. But if you let go of the gas pedal, we go slower. So the question is, is that when we're driving and we need to slow down, should you always use the brake? No. Sometimes it's just letting go of the accelerator. Now let's think of the brake pedal. When we think of brake, we always think about slowing down. But if we have to speed up a little bit, like when we go into a parking spot, sometimes we let go of the brake pedal to go a little bit faster. And that's kind of like trail braking. And then the parking brake that we have in every car keeps the car rolling when we uh, park in a parking spot that is up a hill or down a hill. And we should always set the parking brake. If you're in a manual transmission, you should set the parking brake. When we're on level ground in the driver's ed vehicle, we never set the parking brake. It's only when there's some type of incline or decline. Uh, gauges, so let's go through these real quick. Uh, speedometer tells us how fast we're moving. The odometer tracks the miles that the vehicle has been driven. Uh, tripometer are the miles that you have gone over a certain period of time. And sometimes you can use the tripometer to help you figure out your gas mileage. But we're not going to really get into that. I just want to, if you want to put it in your notes, I can explain it a little bit later. Fuel gauge um, indicates how much fuel we have. The only thing I ask you is if we get below a half, just let me know. When we get below half, I got to start thinking about where we're going to go to fill up with gas. We could go quite a distance because we're a hybrid. Um, I only worry when we get below 100 miles left in the tank. But uh, when we fill up, we can go about 550 to 600 miles on a tank of gas. So that's, you know, that's like to New York City on a, on a tank of gas. Um, these I do want you to know. So write down these three. Alternator, temperature, brake light. All these gauges or lights are indicators of very serious situations in the car. Now, when you start up your car and you turn the key or push the button, your instrument panel will light up like a Christmas tree. And different color lights will come on. And what that's telling you is your computer system is checking to make sure that all these systems are functional and ready to use. If a light stays on, it should be a concern to you, all right? And it may need further attention. So what I want you to write down in your notes, there are basically two main colors to your lights on your gauges. So if it's a red light, it needs your immediate attention, all right? So red lights are pretty serious. So put down red lights, serious, needs your attention. Like the seatbelt indicator is a red light. That needs your attention. Everybody should be in a seatbelt, especially if you're under the age of 18. Now, some lights come on and they're yellow. Could be like your headlights are on. Okay, so that's just warning you. Okay, a yellow light is a warning Red needs attention. So just keep that in mind. So an alternator gauge basically means electrical problem. That's all I want you to write down. Alternator means there's an electrical problem. Could be the battery, could be the alternator. A temperature gauge or light tells you that the engine is running too hot. Now, why would it do that? Your engine is made up of metal. The enemy of metal is heat. So we have coolant and we have oil to help maintain the engine to be functional. Once we get low with oil or low with coolant, so this deals with coolant. If we're low on coolant, the engine's going to run too hot and it's going to start to degrade the metal parts. So a light's going to come on and tell you that you either have a leak or your level is too low. Brake warning light means there's a problem with the brake. It could be low. And there's brake fluid. Most people don't realize this. It's not like your brakes on your bicycle. When you push on the brake pedal, it's not you know pushing something 
up against your tires. That's just you know, there is a brake pad, but there is brake fluid that's going through a brake line to activate the calibers to to stop the vehicle. So I want you to understand it's pretty high functional. I'm not trying to make you a mechanic, but anything that is of fluid type, you should be concerned with. So that's brake fluid. The next one is your oil pressure. This is probably other than gasoline. So write this down. Gasoline is the most important type of fluid for your vehicle. No gas, no drive. If you run out of gas, the car will not go. Now, in my car, it's a little bit different. I have a battery. I'm a hybrid, so I can probably go a little bit. But once my hybrid battery is depleted, then we're stuck. So whenever you start a car, you should always check your fuel gauge. Do I have enough fuel to get me to where I'm going? Now, when the oil pressure light comes on, all it means is that there's not enough pressure lubricating, uh, pushing the oil through the engine to lubricate the engine. So stop driving. I will tell you a true story. This is my daughter. I, you know, usually stories are very personal, okay? So here's a personal story. My daughter was going to Texas for a internship in college. And my wife and I decided that it was such a long drive. We figured we'd drive her there, get her, you know, set it into her apartment and help her out. She had a car at the time. So I told her, I said, Morgan, I want you to take it to a mechanic. I want him to check it over because I don't have the time and I'm not a mechanic. You know, change the oil, get everything taken care of so we can make it. It's an older car. We got halfway to Texas in Virginia. We had been driving all day long. The oil light comes on and within three minutes, the engine just started to smoke and steam and the engine blew. It just, it was done with. The engine was ruined. The mechanic never changed the oil and put new oil in. So we thought because she took it, we didn't check it. Never take anything for granted. So we asked for the service, but we never received it. To put a new engine, and we didn't put a new engine into her vehicle because her car wasn't worth it, but $2,500 it was going to cost to get a new engine. The oil change that she was supposed to get was going to probably cost her $30 to $40. You need to know. So this is going to be part of your homework. I am going to put on Facebook page a worksheet that deals with knowing what type of fluids go into your vehicle. So your homework over the weekend with your mom, your dad, you can do it on your own, do it with your boyfriend, girlfriend, I don't care who you do it with. But I want you to go around and find out some certain information about your vehicle. All right, and I'm going to have it posted on the Facebook page. Um, next thing, be familiar with your heat, your air conditioner, uh, radio and phone, how, that's, um, how they work. Uh, know the trunk release, the hood release, the gas release. Um, there's not, nothing more embarrassing when you go to a garage and they tell you to pop the hood so they can check your oil. And you go, how do you pop the hood? I have never done it before. You should. If you're a licensed driver, you should know how to open up your hood. So um, be familiar. Now, write this down. Part of what I want you to do with that homework, with the worksheet, is to use your car manual. So make sure you go to the glove compartment and you pull out the car manual. That's going to help you answer all the questions. Know where the headlights, windshield wipers are on the driver's ed car. Uh, headlights are off to the left. The um, windshield wipers are off to the right. Um, there are different uh, speeds for them. Okay, this is what I want you to do. And I think I'm going to make this for the homework. So I'm going to I'm gonna get out of this. We're going to talk about uh, manual transmission real quick. So well, you want to drive a car with a manual? Well, I'll show you that in a minute. So write down manual transmission. 
Okay, manual transmission, standard uh, transmission means the same. So rather than an automatic, you have to go from gear to gear to make the car go faster or go slower. So you still have a gas pedal, you still have a brake, but guess what? You've got an added pedal. So now you've got three pedals down below and you're scratching your head and you're going, wait a minute, three pedals, I've got two feet. What is happening? How am I going to do this? It's going to be too difficult. It's not. Okay, this is what I want you to write down. Your right foot will always be, no matter what vehicle you drive, your right foot will always be for your accelerator and your brake. When you get into a manual transmission, the left foot will be exclusively for the clutch pedal. All right? Now, what makes it difficult driving a manual transmission is you've got to coordinate between your left foot clutching and using the right foot to either accelerate or to brake. So you've got more moving pieces going. So driving a manual transmission is way harder than an automatic. So besides a clutch, you're going to have a shift and an accelerator pedal. This down, a clutch is the third pedal from the brake it must be fully depressed down or disengaged to break the connection between the engine and the transmission. So really that middle part is what I want you to write down. Press the clutch all the way down so it's disengaged to break the connection to the engine and the transmission. The car won't stall. Now when you let go of the clutch pedal, you should be also pushing down on the accelerator to make the car go. If you don't let go of the clutch correctly, it will either stall or if you hesitate and use too much acceleration, you're going to spin your tires. Okay, you're going to spin out. The shift on a gear shift, it could be a three speed, four speed, five speed, six speed, doesn't matter. Whatever car you buy, the more um, gears you have, the more shifting you have to do but the more enjoyable your drive will be. And usually you have more control in bad weather when you're in a manual transmission. This I do want you to write down, friction point. A friction point is the point where the engine and the transmission is engaged. Okay, so you're letting go of the clutch about halfway. You're gonna feel or hear the movement of the vehicle. And the easiest way to practice this is in reverse and doing it in a parking lot. So if you want to find the friction point, practice with the clutch pedal, do it in reverse, let the clutch out halfway, accelerate a little bit, feel the car go backwards, get a feel for it. And you can hear the engine. It will change its, its sound. And I'm going to show you a video. A guy did a real good job with this video of explaining how to drive a manual. We'll show you this in a moment. Um, use your parking brake or emergency brake, whatever you want to call it, to start on a hill so you don't roll back. Uh, don't need to know all the gears, but uh, each gear has a particular speed that you need to be traveling in and try to move one gear at a time, all right? And you get definitely more power to get up a hill uh, on your lower gear. So don't get caught in a gear that's too high. Uh, Downshifting is just the opposite. Uh, you don't want to get um, going down the hill too fast. So you go from fourth to fifth. I mean, from fourth to third, third to second, second to first. And by going down each number, the car will slow itself down without using the brake. And that's the nice thing about me being in a manual transmission. So let's take a look at the video. Um, after the video, I'll come back on. We'll talk about the worksheet and we'll talk about uh, driving uh, for those of you that want to grab some time. So uh, this will take us right to the end. It's about a 10, 11 minute video on driving a manual transmission. So you want to drive a car with a manual transmission? Well, I have bad news and good news. The bad news is there are fewer models on the market now than ever before that have a proper three-pedal manual transmission. The good news is the ones that do offer the feature are easier to learn on than old cars were. Whether you're going to drive a new car or an old car, I commend you and I'll get you started. Now the first part of the lesson is I'm going to explain what's going on when you're operating the manual transmission. Now it isn't absolutely necessary. It could just be about a stick and a pedal. But what I found is people tend to grasp this a little bit faster, learn faster if they understand what is actually going on under the surface. 
A car with a gas or diesel engine has a transmission with multiple gears for the same reason a bicycle does. A good bicycle, not one of those retro hipster one speed bikes. Please. The idea behind having these gears is you can pedal only so fast. When you reach a certain point and to go faster you need to shift up. Same thing is true with a car's engine. Let's take a look at the tachometer. The tachometer is a gauge that shows engine speed and essentially all cars have them even automatic, you just don't pay attention to it. Uh, it'll be marked typically 1, 2, 3, 4 or in some cases 10, 20, 30 but the idea is multiplied by some number that is the revolutions per minute of the engine. Uh, and when you hit the gas a bit you'll see the needle goes up as the engine speed increases. Typically though a gas engine will run only up to about six to eight thousand RPM. It depends on the car and there are some exceptions. In this car it's about 7400 RPM where you see uh, a red line begin. Uh, and that red line is called the red line. And the engine is not supposed to run in the red line because it can be damaged. Now newer cars are less likely to actually incur damage than older ones but still that's not where you want to be. So if you want to go faster and faster in a car you need to be able to shift to the next gear. Simple, right? Just like a bicycle. Well, there's one area where it's not like a bicycle. On a bicycle, when you start out, you just pedal. One, two, three, four. You can start from a standing stop. An engine, on the other hand, has an idle speed of typically 750 RPM. So it'll run from 750 RPM to, in this case, 7400. But below 750, nothing. So what's happening is, when you're sitting still, your engine is going 750 RPM and your transmission and the gears are not moving at all. And you've got to get them going together at the same speed. And that is going to be your job through the use of the clutch. Clutch, pedal. And you are going to suck at it. It's going to be hilarious. To me, you're going to hate it, but I'm laughing just thinking about it. But here, you probably ought to laugh at it too because you're going to be bad. But if you stick with it and practice, you're going to get better. So let's start with the pedals. You'll see the extra one here, the third, that is the clutch pedal. But it looks like there are four pedals in this car, and that is because this one is technically called the dead pedal. But a better word for that is the footrest. It doesn't really do anything. And footrest is a good name because that is what you're supposed to do, and that is rest your foot there. Do not leave your foot on the clutch pedal. The whole point behind the clutch is use it and then you get off of it. Put your foot on the dead pedal or the footrest. Here's an important tip before you even get started. When you're operating the clutch pedal, you need your whole leg. You're not putting your heel down, anchoring it like you might with the accelerator pedal and just tilting at the ankle. You need your whole leg. It's a little bit more like a brake pedal in that regard. Also, when you apply the pedal, you always go all the way down to the floor and release all the way out. Always step in all the way, release all the way, and when you're not using the clutch, rest on the dead pedal. Now before you even head out, if you're just learning how to drive a manual transmission, think ahead and wear sensible shoes. You don't need fancy driving shoes or anything, but here's a tip. Don't wear a big clunky shoe and don't wear anything with a big heel. And don't judge me. I'm trying to help you and it's free. Once, once you learn how to drive, you can wear whatever you want. But for training purposes, be sensible. Now let's get to know the shifter or the stick, which is how you put the transmission in the different gears. Uh, the pattern for the forward gears is pretty much the same in everything and you'll see it either on top of the knob or somewhere nearby. Uh, typically, the difference between vehicles is, is really just about how many forward gears it has. This car has six. Uh, older cars may stop at four forward gears. Some cars these days have seven. All just affects how much shifting you'll be doing. Um, now, one of the most important things you need to know is when it's not in gear, and that is neutral. Neutral position is straight in the middle of all of these, and you'll know it's in neutral when the stick wobbles left and right. Now, I'm going to step on the clutch pedal even though the engine is off. Uh, and you'll see now I'm in first gear up and to the left. Now notice it doesn't slide left and right in neutral. There's my wobble. So 
uh, first, second is below, to the right and up is third, and so on. It's pretty simple stuff. Now, all cars are going to have a reverse gear. That can be in a different location. It used to be up and to the right for a lot of cars. Now and Nowadays, you're starting to see them on the left. The best cars will have a little lockout, like this lift collar, uh, that prevents you from going into reverse unless you really mean it. And when you're practicing going into first, once you get a little bit good at that, you can start doing the same thing with reverse. Okay, you want to find an empty or nearly empty uh, parking lot or road. Uh, and it's important that it be flat because you're going to be uh, practicing taking off in first gear and reverse. And the effects of gravity can just complicate things. Uh, it, you need to start the car. When you start a manual transmission, it's always important to make sure it is in neutral. Wiggle that stick. Uh, and in newer cars especially, uh, it's necessary, not just... Uh, good practice to step on the clutch pedal because that will allow the engine to start. Without stepping on that pedal, you can turn the key all you want. It wouldn't have started with a new car. So uh, when you take off uh, from a stop in a car with a uh, manual transmission, you are essentially trying to coordinate the application of the gas and the release of the clutch pedal or the engagement of the clutch. Uh, but what I'm going to do is have you practice first without stepping on the gas at all. Just use the clutch pedal to get a feel for the clutch engagement. Um, now, when you lift off the pedal, you're engaging the clutch. When you step on, you're disengaging. I'm just going to call it clutch in and clutch out because that's the simplest thing to remember when the time comes to actually do it. So what you'll do is you're going to watch my feet, watch everything I do. You're stepping on the clutch pedal, all right? Stick goes into first. I happen to have the brake on, so I'm going to take the parking brake off. And then you're just going to slowly let that clutch pedal out. See what I'm doing right now. Now, if you have a newer car, this is, is actually uh, a little easier because the engine control unit, the computer, senses the load and will compensate and give you a little bit more gas. So here you can see my foot's off the... Uh, pedal. I'm in first gear and I'm moving. Uh, pretty simple stuff. Every car is different. I'm going to do it again for you. Here's how we stop. I'm, I've got my foot over the brake. Uh, clutch in. And I pull the shifter out of first into neutral and come to a stop. Um, all cars are different. What you're doing is you're getting a feel for where the clutch uh, engages. In some cars it's lower in the pedal travel, like close to the floor. and some it's higher up. All cars are at least a little bit different. So again, clutch in, first gear, let it out slowly. And there you go. You put her around, you can put her around a little bit in first gear if you want to. We'll discuss whether or not we drive in first gear uh, in a bit. So clutch in, stick into neutral, brake, we stop. Now it's actually the same situation uh, for going in reverse, aside from the gear being different. Uh, clutch in, I'm lifting the collar as necessary for this, putting it in reverse, and slowly letting that pedal out. Now I am looking behind me and I have a backup camera, so it's, I don't want it to look like I'm just blindly backing up. There we go, and we're moving. Now you might find that, I'm gonna stop now, ready, remember? Clutch in, brake, and take the stick into neutral. Uh, reverse gear tends to be a little bit faster than first because it's the only one you've got. Uh, so it will feel a little bit different. You're going to want to practice with that too. Now, having gotten a feel for the clutch uh, application, uh, I'm going to... Uh, show you how we apply the gas and release the clutch at the same time. And it lets you do the same thing you just did, but faster. Here we go. Clutch in. First gear. Now, watch my feet. I'm going to add some gas and release the clutch. And we're moving in first gear. And you can hear we're moving faster this time. Okay, same as last time. Clutch in, braking stick back into neutral. Now, you probably want me to tell you what RPM you should be going uh, when you release the clutch to take off. 
I can't tell you that. Uh, reason being, first of all, all cars are different. Uh, I want to say it's going to be around 2,000 RPM just to get you going. But uh, first, all cars are different. And second, I don't want you focusing on the tachometer. You're much better off getting a feel for this uh, just by doing it. And I feel the same way about when we get to the point where we're shifting through the higher gears as well. So uh, we did it once. Let's do it again. Ready? Clutch in into first gear, adding a little gas, letting out the clutch. Okay. Now let me give you one tip that I think uh, is one of the most useful things that, that I've found uh, from instructing people on how to drive manual transmissions and that is there's a notion that this has to be the perfect synchronized balletic application and release perfectly even and that's actually not true what I've found is a lot of people find the process a lot easier while they're learning if they part way through releasing that clutch they just if it starts to grab just hold for a second and then release the clutch the rest of the way I'm gonna try and do that again so you can see what I'm what I'm doing Rather than just trying to robotically go in with the gas and out with the clutch, it's you're applying, you come out a bit with, with your clutch foot. See my hand here. Wait a second. When it, when it starts to grab, just give it a half second and then release the rest of the way. Here's what I'm doing. Ready? Kind of hard to see, I know, but maybe you understand from what I'm describing. Uh, and the thing with that is you've got to be a little bit careful. Uh, about overdoing it. You cannot take forever to get your foot off the clutch pedal. Uh, so basically what he's just gone over is that friction point. So that's the real bare bones of starting driving a manual transmission. I highly recommend if you ever get an opportunity to learn manual transmission, do that. Now the other thing, remember, you do not have to go back to the DMV to get retested if you choose to do your test in an automatic but by a standard six months to a year down the road, that's fine. You don't have to go back to the DMV to get another test. So that brings us right up to where we need to be for next week. So your homework is going to be those worksheets that I will be posting on um, the Facebook page. So that's what you can do for the next half hour. Uh, have your parents help you with the know your vehicle sheet. I still have some times. Is there anybody that can drive uh, tomorrow at 2 o'clock? I've got Saturday at 9, 1, 2, and 3. And Tuesday, I've got 3 and 4. So I've got Jack on Saturday. i got Colette tomorrow at 9. So if someone can take those other times, I would be greatly appreciated. That will move us along. Um, I think that is it for tonight. Make sure that you sign out. You've been here uh, to the very, very end. So I appreciate that. We've got our first week under our belt and we're on our way. So next Tuesday, we will be doing uh, seat belts, airbags, and helmets. We'll be talking about safety equipment. So that's it for Driver's Ed. Uh, have a good night. Have a good weekend. Enjoy. I think you got Martin Luther King Day. Let me check. Let's see. Does the school, yeah, you have it off. You have Monday off. I see right here on the calendar, school calendar. So have a great day off. I'm not driving on Monday, but I will drive the other times that I mentioned. So text me if you want to drive, and we'll see you here next Tuesday at 730.